Today we uh, will be considering the prophets. And uh, the prophetic literature of the Old Testament, what we call the literary prophets, because not all of the prophets wrote material, and we don't have their oracles written down. Uh, we saw a couple of those yesterday with Elijah and Elisha. But the literary prophets cover about one-third of the Old Testament and about one-fourth of the entire Bible. So it's a significant corpus of material. Today and tomorrow, because we'll be covering some of those prophets tomorrow, um, we can't obviously go into great depth <laughs> when you're talking about one-third of the Old Testament. Um, I'm expecting and hoping that you will have the opportunity to go into greater depth in subsequent courses that you'll have, exegetical courses, Old Testament courses, uh, studying particular prophetic books. Today we're just going to get, uh, skim the surface of those, uh, touch upon some high points, uh, some of the most uh, significant passages, and uh, in a very pragmatic sense, <laughs> the passages that appear in the exam so that you're familiar with what those passages are. Okay. Um, for the quiz tomorrow then, um, you should be familiar with um, the uh, pre-exile prophets. Okay. Uh, this particular piece that uh, you were to read today. And um, one thing that you should be able to do is to identify where each prophet fits into the sock drawer, okay? Into which sock drawer, using that metaphor that uh, Pastor Rossow has developed here. So on page 8-4 here, you've got kind of the chest of drawers here and uh, the sock drawer. Uh, you may want to even label that um, accordingly. Uh, the vertical columns here, the left-hand column is for the 8th century prophets, and the right-hand column is for the 7th century prophets. And then in terms of the horizontal uh, levels there, uh, the top one would be for the north, northern kingdom of Israel, middle for the south, southern kingdom of Judah, and bottom for foreign countries. Okay. So be able to, <coughs> to slot the uh, prophets where they fit accordingly. Okay. Well, um, we're going to begin looking at the pre-exile. Uh, prophets here, and in one sense you could say there are really two exiles. There's the exile of the northern kingdom, which takes place in 722, 721, and, uh, but there's no real return, at least not um, in the way of a unified people coming back uh, after that exile. Uh, the second exile will take place in 587, and that will be of the southern kingdom. So we begin now with the um, uh, prophets before the exile of the northern kingdom of Israel, 722. And um, uh, in your crossways guide, and I apologize, I forgot to, to check on the discrepancy that Kyle had noted there in terms of the um, the years for Jeroboam. Uh, I'll try to do that for tomorrow. Actually, uh, it, it wasn't a discrepancy. It said that uh, the king became, the next king of the line of Judah became king in the 18th year of reign of Jeroboam, meaning Rehoboam finished in 17 years, died. That next year would be the 18th year of Jeroboam. Oh, okay. So um, seven years there. the issue was with Rehoboam, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There was only seven and years. And that, that he... Okay. Okay. 
okay. and that he was to live 17 years or right for 17 years. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry, okay. I just neglected to check That's that. Fine. And so we'll see what issue may be there. Okay, but uh, now you have here laid out where the prophets fit uh, according to the crossways material. Uh, I do not agree with everything that the that uh, Harry Wendt has developed here in Crossways and uh, um, in my conversation with him he says that's fine you know uh, you teach it the way that uh, uh, you see it um, for example he will identify a number of these prophets down here as post exilic uh, whereas I would see them as pre exilic uh, but generally what with with the prophets up here um, there's no problem uh, he has also identified, uh, not in the red print, but in the white print, prophets that preceded the literary prophets. So today we're going to be looking at the literary prophets, those who actually wrote or scribes wrote down their oracles. But there were prophets before that. Again, you've got Elijah, Elisha, okay, and uh, they, they are given the title in the Old Testament of Nabi, of prophet, okay? Um, and so even Samuel, as we saw, he was one of the first of the cl classical prophets. Um, but even earlier than that, Moses is called a prophet. Uh, Miriam uh, is given the title of prophetess. Uh, we do have some female prophetesses in the Old Testament. Hulda is another one. Uh, down during the reign of Josiah. Uh, Isaiah is described as being married to a prophetess. So uh, there are some examples. Uh, none of the literary prophets, though, are female. Okay, so we're going to be taking a look now at where these various literary prophets fit in the preparation to the um, exile of the northern kingdom and then the exile of the southern kingdom. Okay, well, that's just a more close-up view. So really, we're going to now be looking at the bottom half of all of this. Um, just to be acquainted now with how this fits into the library, uh, the corpus of writings that we call the Old Testament and the whole scriptures, uh, for us as Christians, we typically organize it in this way with the history writing poetry, okay, mostly psalms and the wisdom literature, and then the prophets, and we divide between the major prophets and the minor prophets. We distinguish those two. Now, it's very important to recognize that the nomenclature here of major and minor has nothing to do with significance. It has to do with volume. So it's not quality, it's quantity. And so they're considered major pro prophets here because they're much larger writings, right? larger books. Okay? And uh, so the, there are essentially three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Lamentations is also included because it's also believed to have been written by Jeremiah. And, uh, and the text itself attests to that. And uh, so it's just uh, connected there, kind of a epilogue to Jeremiah. Okay? Um, if you compare this then to the Hebrew way of organization, uh, you remember that they divided up into the, the, the Jews, even today, divided into three major sections the law, the Torah, the prophets, Navi'im, okay, and the writings, Ketubim, okay. And um, uh, so they distinguish then between the former prophets and the latter prophets. They do also make a distinction between what we would call as Christians the uh, major prophets and the minor prophets, okay, um, in that. Uh, the minor prophets are called the Twelve. 
So there are 12 of these minor prophets. They don't call that the, the minor prophets, but they call them the 12, uh, just as we would have 12 here. And I think earlier I, I left out Daniel. Daniel's also included in the major prophets for the Christian structure. Uh, where you have some differences then uh, is that uh, Lamentations, which for the Christians would be part of the major prophets, is then included in the writings in the Jewish organization. And um, uh, Daniel as well is included in the writings. Somewhere in there um, would be Daniel. Okay. So uh, those are some distinctions. But what's important for us to recognize here is the distinction between the major and the minor prophets has to do with the volume of their writing, quantity of what they wrote, not the quality. So <clears throat> um, what is essentially the definition of a prophet according to the Old Testament, the scriptures? Uh, what's the role of the prophet? Essentially, the primary role is to be a one who tells forth, speaks forth the word of the Lord. So the prophets were a kind of mouthpiece of Yahweh. Okay? Uh, the Greek word from which we get prophet, prophetes, literally means to speak forth. Okay? And uh, so the prophets were those who, as the Apostle Peter says, were moved by the Holy Spirit. They spoke of God. They spoke from God. God is the source. So they become the mouthpiece of, of God to communicate his word. And thus frequently, the oracles of the prophets will begin with this formula. Thus says the Lord. And in this case, I should have capitalized that because it's really thus says Yahweh. This is the word of the Lord. Thus says Yahweh. They're speaking on behalf of Yahweh. And so they are kind of Yahweh's emissary, Yahweh's representative. Oftentimes they are like Yahweh's prosecuting attorney. They're coming and uh, acting as the attorney on behalf of Yahweh to speak his judgment based on the covenant, covenant law. So almost like a judicial uh, context here, an attorney who comes to uh, uh, speak forth the, the, the judgment, okay? And, um, and oftentimes, the primary audience of the prophet was to be the king, either the king in the north or the king in the southern kingdom, okay? The king of Israel or the king of Judah, because remember, uh, according to the covenant relationship here with Israel, Yahweh was to be the king. And the human king was simply a vice-regent, viceroy to him. And so oftentimes when the human king would take on, assume and presume uh, the authority that should only be God's, then the prophet was sent to speak to that king and to kind of set matters straight. So we saw this even earlier with Nathan and David, where Nathan came and spoke the word of the Lord to David in several cases, both with the covenant uh, of the dynasty, good news, and bringing judgment to him, um, confronting him with his sin uh, with Bathsheba. And uh, so law and gospel, uh, they would speak. Okay. Uh, notice here then uh, for the literary prophets that their message also includes both law and gospel. Okay. Oftentimes there's a popular misconception that the prophets only spoke condemnation and judgment and the curses of the covenant. They certainly do deliver that message, but it's not the exclusive message. They also deliver the message of the gospel, of God's grace, his mercy, his compassion to his people, and also the promise of God to keep his covenant uh, ultimately in the deliverance of a Messiah, a uh, Savior. Okay? Uh, 
So it includes both of these, law and gospel. One of the byproducts of this primary role of being a forth teller, telling forth God's word, is to foretell the future. Okay? So in bringing the word of law, of judgment, they would foretell the coming disaster upon the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, whatever the, the audience may be here. And so they would say, uh, foretell judgment that God would bring Syria, God would bring the Babylonians, God would bring the Egyptians. They are foretelling this. This will happen. Uh, the temple will be destroyed. Jerusalem will be destroyed. People will be led off as captives. So there is that foretelling of the law of judgment, but also foretelling of the gospel, uh, foretelling of God's restoration of his people, of the return of the remnant, of God's deliverance from the exile, and ultimately God's deliverance from the bondage of sin, uh, the God's provision of the Messiah, of the coming Savior. And uh, so these then um, are actually predictive prophecies that would take place in the future, sometimes far into the future, many centuries into the future. But the primary role here is that of speaking forth God's word. And sometimes that word was addressing the future, and in that sense it would be predictive and it would be foretelling. Uh, but again, oftentimes we, we think of prophets simply as those who foretell the future. That's not the primary role, according to the scriptures. Okay? Uh, one other thing that is important for us to recognize regarding the prophets um, here in the Old Testament is that they're not just kind of radicals. Uh, they're not just these kind of counter-cultural revolutionaries who are just kind of into being anti-establishment. But in fact, they are somewhat conservative because they are always grounded in their message in the past and in the covenant that God established with his people. So they're actually pointing the people back to the past to the covenant God had established, what God had done with them, what the covenant stipulations were, and pointing back to the covenant which the people had now broken. So you'll hear a lot of covenant talk and even the word covenant and how the covenant had been broken in the language and the oracles of these prophets. Okay? So uh, the prophets do foretell the coming judgment, though, both upon the south and the north, uh, northern kingdom, uh, the um, Capital is Samaria, the southern kingdom, capital is Jerusalem. Okay? And uh, they foretell the judgment that would come at the hand of the Assyrians. And uh, the Assyrians would be God's instrument of judgment, primarily upon the northern kingdom, but sometimes also upon the southern kingdom. It would not be the ultimate um, hand of judgment upon the southern kingdom, but it would be upon the northern kingdom. And God now, because he's the Lord of all nations, can use pagan um, terrorist nations like Assyria to do his bidding and to carry out his holy war even upon the people who had been in covenant with him but now had broken the covenant. And remember, that was part of the curses of the covenant, that a foreign nation would come and oppress and remove the Israelites from the land. They will also then speak of the Babylonians uh, later on who will come and um, oppress the southern kingdom and bring, being, be God's instrument of judgment upon the southern kingdom. And even some... Uh, uh, use of Egypt. God will use even Egypt to be his instrument of judgment.
Okay, so this is kind of the basic overview of the function of the prophets uh, during these Old Testament centuries, particularly the 8th, 7th, and into the 6th century. Okay, well, before we begin uh, looking at specific prophets, any observations or comments about any of these? Okay, what we're going to do here roughly is to uh, follow the order that Pastor Rossow has provided to us here in uh, your handout, which is a logical order. Uh, we begin with the north, the prophets to the northern kingdom in the 8th century. And God's prophets to the northern kingdom will only be in the 8th century not the seventh century. Why is that the case? Because <laughs> the northern kingdom isn't around in the seventh century. Okay, 722, it's destroyed. So um, uh, the prophets to the northern kingdom will only be in the eighth century. So we'll start with those, and then we'll go to the prophets to the southern kingdom, eighth century first, then seventh century, and then we'll go to the prophets that were sent to foreign nations. And that can include both 8th and 7th centuries. So that's the order we'll be following essentially what Pastor Rossow has laid out here. So we begin with Amos. Okay. Amos, 8th century prophet to the northern kingdom. Uh, the years of his ministry are approximately... 770 to 750 BC. And for all of these years, these are approximations. And typically what I've done is, is brought the broadest range of years. Quite likely, uh, the actual time of ministry was narrower than that. But uh, the broadest possible parameters here is, are what you're provided with. For the exam, you don't have to know these precise years. So don't feel like you have to uh, memorize them. But it's just to help you get a context of the time. So in terms of our timetable here from the crossways um, visual, Amos falls about at this time in the northern kingdom around the reign of Jeroboam II, uh, which was a time of great prosperity for the northern kingdom, probably the um, prime time for the northern kingdom, if you could call uh, its golden age when there was the most prosperity and power and influence, that was at this time when Amos speaks. Okay, so um, Amos actually does not originate from the northern kingdom, though, the kingdom of Israel. He actually originates here in Tekoa, which is a small town about five miles south of Jerusalem, so well into the southern kingdom of Judah. And we're told that he was a shepherd there and a dresser of fig trees. So he's basically a agriculturalist. Um, animal husbandry. Uh, he's a farmer and a rancher, if you will, a uh, country guy, uh, country bumpkin, some would say. However, as you read his literature here, his writing, it is not simplistic and he's no simpleton. It is beautiful, eloquent writing, marvelous writing. And uh, the literary characteristics are very, very high. Amos becomes kind of the model here and the standard for the literary prophets that follow. Uh, he's really the first one, and he's the standard that they seek to emulate uh, his, his style here. Okay, So he speaks very, very eloquently. Again, uh, he's, he then uh, goes to the northern kingdom, 
and begins preaching here at the Shrine of Bethel, or Bethel. The capital where the king will be is here in Samaria. And again, this is during the reign of Jeroboam II, very prosperous time for the northern kingdom. And we're at a time when everything looks like it's going well, everything looks like um, the future is bright and sunny, Amos comes and announces judgment. Okay? And he does so at this site, Bethel. Uh, why do you think he chooses Bethel? Good, good. There's a shrine there. Do you remember at the division of the kingdoms, Jeroboam the first set up two shrines with golden calves, one here in the south right at the border, and then one way at north in Dan. And so his people then would, could go and worship, and this way they wouldn't have to cross over and worship in the southern territory. Okay. So he goes now and speaks at this site where there is this shrine, the golden calf, and uh, announces God's judgment to them. Okay. Um, this is a time of great prosperity, of great wealth. And Amos will speak to those who are wealthy. He uh, addresses them as the cows of Bashan. Okay. Uh, Bashan would be territory up here, uh, very lush territory up kind of the Golan Heights, uh, but many, many cattle and so forth, fat cattle. And so in the Israelite territory, you have this image of the cows of Bashan. He calls the the women, uh, the, the rich women and the um, inhabitants there, cows of Bashan, uh, because they're fat and they're uh, luxuriating and, and so forth. Okay, so there's great, great wealth. But there is also great poverty. There is a, an extreme economic gap between the rich and the poor. And the rich really don't give a hoot about the poor. They're failing to attend to the covenant responsibility that they have, not only to Yahweh, but to their sisters and brothers in the covenant community here, uh, laid down in the law of Moses to care for those who are poor and oppressed. Okay? And archaeology has confirmed this as well. Uh, from the period of Jer Jeroboam II here. You have these, uh, for the time, large mansions, okay? uh, two-story mansions. And not far, you'll have evidence of these hovels, these uh, shacks uh, where people were living in significant poverty. Oftentimes, they were, these were just lean-tos next to the wall of the city. And so you see the contrast there in terms of the economic disparity and social inequality. Okay, so Amos begins, and if you will please turn in your Bibles to Amos. Amos begins by attacking one by one Israel's neighbors. And he follows this formula. He begins right away in chapter 1, and he follows this formula. And again, this is a formula you ought to be able to recognize as coming from the prophet Amos. It says, for three transgressions of Damascus, and then later of Moab and, and all of these different neighboring countries, Phoenicia, so forth. And for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they, and then he will identify the crime, the sin of that country, because they did that, I will send fire to destroy them or I will send some kind of judgment upon them. So this is the kind of formula that we see here. And Amos goes one by one, 
speaking judgment of all the nations that surround the northern kingdom of Israel here. Okay, so first of all, he attacks the northern enemy, which would be the biggest thorn in Israel's side, as you read the narrative uh, from particularly uh, Second Kings, where there's regularly uh, conflict with the Syrians, with the Arameans. So he says, judgment will befall Syria, Philistia, Phoenicia, Edom, Ammon, Moab. And so you've got six nations cited. And you can almost picture the people here who are listening to him. And they're saying, yeah, preach it, brother. Applauding, whooping it up. Give it to our enemies. Tell it to them, preacher. You know, so they're, they're caught up in this. And, and it's a kind of a, a sense of self-righteousness. Okay. Yeah, all those guys out there, all those bad guys, let them have it, God. Let them have what's coming to them. And then the seventh is Judah, okay, the southern kingdom. So he's saying judgment will come upon Judah, your southern brothers here. But that's not much of a problem for the northern kingdom. I mean, they've been at war with the the uh, Judahites. So, yeah, okay. Let's get rid of them, too. Now, most likely they were assuming this is it. Okay. So this is a judgment against all of our neighbors because you notice he identifies seven nations that will receive judgment. And typically oracles would uh, seven is the number of completion in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The book of Revelation has lots of sevens, okay, the number of completion. And so the assumption here, most likely of the hearers, is this is it. He's done. He's told all them what judgment will befall them. But then he finishes with one more, Israel. For you as well, judgment will come. And the worst judgment will befall you. So all of a sudden, the applause is silenced. And there's this deathly silence as people have heard this. OK? Um, so he says, in chapter 2, verse 6, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted, a man and his father go to the same girl so that my holy name is profane. Uh, and then they just, you know, they lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fine. Okay, so then he, he uh, identifies the judgment. And in chapter uh, 3, uh, he, he reinforces this. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. He's kind of saying, yeah, there's all these other nations, but you, you are the ones who I chose. You had great privilege. But with that great privilege comes great responsibility. And since you have failed in the covenant responsibilities, the judgment upon you will be greatest of all as well. So great judgment here. Okay. So, um, and the judgment, again, the context here is the oppression of the poor. Uh, message that is still 
very, very timely and rings highly relevant for us today as we look at the condition of the world. And we as Americans are these rich people. Typically, those of us who are, you know, here at the seminary <laughs> or in church work see ourselves as middle class at best, maybe lower middle class, you know, your poor students. And speaking in terms of the context of our country, that's true. But if you, how many of you have traveled overseas to third world countries? You see the vast difference. You see that even we who are middle class, lower middle class, are the wealthy compared to the world. We're in the upper 5% of the economic strata when you compare us to the world. And um, just the other night with the Parade of Nations uh, for the Olympics, you know, they were I, speaking about some of these nations and uh, talking about how the average annual income is 130 bucks average annual income. And uh, that's just very typical. So uh, we can listen to this word as well. And what is our responsibilities uh, in the face of a lot of poverty in the world today, too, as rich Americans? OK. Um, the judgment, then, that will befall is that um, the people of Israel will be led away into captivity into Assyria here. So you've got this line in the hook. And they'll be led away uh, on hooks, uh, like hooks around the nose. And uh, we read this in chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. Hear this, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. And you shall go out through the breaches, that is the broken down breach of the city wall that the, the sense here is that your defenses now have been uh, breached and the uh, enemy force has come in and they'll take you out through that breach uh, with hooks around your nose. Each one straight ahead and you shall be cast out into Harmon. Okay. Um, Continues then in verse 4, come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leaven and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord God. So there's also a, a message of condemnation to the false worship that's going on here at Bethel um, and in, in all of Israel. Okay. 